back everyone once again to another new installment of Screenplay Rewind because we just started up this recording and had to restart it again because of Discord issues. I'm Jeff. I'm Ron. And hopefully you can hear us. Uh, if not, we'll probably have to restart again. See how this goes. Uh, I think they can hear us. It's just we can't hear each other. So I think if we both just, just start talking for an hour, it'll be fine. Yeah, we'll just pantomime just back and forth. I'll, I'll dress up like Chris Hemsworth in this movie and just dance. And that's how I'll <laughs> communicate all of my reviews of the film. If we did a uh, YouTube upload to this, I think just him dancing on a loop would be the only video for this. No, I, I, have, a, I have a better idea. Uh, next year for Halloween, you go as uh, Jeff Bridges as the priest, and I'll just go as like half shirtless Chris Hemsworth, and it'd be the greatest <laughs> thing ever. I don't know if I can grow that mustache. I'm going to try, though. It uh, might take me It might take me literally all year. I was going to say, you might want to get started on the mustache now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So this fucking movie. This movie. Is, like we were just talking about earlier on the like uh second installment of us trying to record this podcast, but uh yeah, go look at the fucking Wikipedia description and just uh <laughs> have enjoy that fever dream because it is just like non sequitur the movie. I I now I want to know what other movies I should look up to see how Wikipedia have condensed it down into like three paragraphs. <laughs> right, like what's Be- the most like <laughs> like Inception? People dream and buildings get weird. <laughs> the movie. <laughs> uh, I wonder what a Tarantino movie looks like condensed like this. I think I shot Marvin in the face. That's the description. <laughs> I wonder how many sentences are dedicated to the El Royale with cheese. <laughs> Good segue. Right? Good segue back in the movie we we're supposed to be talking about. And also, important to talk about because everyone kind of shits in this movie for being a Tarantino esque movie which is really fucking silly to me, but we'll get into that. Bad Times at the El Royale, we had, uh, I think you'd said we both had it on our list, right? Wasn't this one you'd yes. been kind of on the, on the short list for a while too? Yeah, mine was going to be uh, pretty pretty early next year probably by the time we got through our December stuff and everything. Yeah, it, it had been on my short list for a while too. Uh, I say short list, we're almost on like episode 40 of the show, which is fucking I wild. Know. I know. I was looking crazy. at that on the uh the anchor app earlier. I was like, what the when the fuck did we get thirty seven episodes done? I was like, okay. You wanna hate we can just make a uh Grudge Juno podcast. You wanna <laughs> talk about that for a few weeks? That's what that's what we talk about for the entire year, like the grown ups too. I think uh, podcast for a year. We just talk about Grudge Juno for fifty I think if weeks, we think ever start a podcast about just movies with terrible endings, it's just gonna be called Grudge Juno is the name Grudge, of the podcast. Yeah. Grudge Juno returns. That way, hopefully, at least one person will go to work and at the water cooler be like, so on my way in, I was listening to Grudge Juno this morning. (laughs) If if only one person in the world had to say that, it it would have been worth it. (laughs) Right? Oh, man. Yeah, I don't know where to get started with this movie, but let's do the uh, quick spoiler warning, of course. Yes, full spoilers for Bad Times at the El Royale. Um... If you have not watched it, I highly recommend watching it before we get into it because this shit is going to bounce around like uh, like a pinball machine. But it, yeah, man, it it's so depressing when I think back. And you you talked about this when we were just talking off mic a few days ago. But just like how few people were in the theater when you and I saw it there, man. It's just, oh, it's so sad, so sad. But, uh, but there's a moment in the movie that you and me being the only two people in the theater allowed us to just exclaim loudly when it happens and i'm going to talk in depth about it when we get there just near the end because it's fucking yeah. amazing yes yeah, this movie has a lot of really really great moments but before we talk about the movie we have a quick little question to run through Ooh. yeah you thought we forgot bobby <laughs> we did not forget all right and this is from Bobby himself once again. Again, if you want to email the show, any prompts, any questions, we'll talk about whatever the fuck. We talked about Grudge Juno for, what, 45 minutes last time? We're we'll still talk talking about, about Grudge Juno. Uh, and so <laughs> Bobby starts off his email with, Descent to Masterpiece. Juno survives the real ending we needed. And she, Laura Croft, a pickaxe to the knee isn't going to stop her. One piece of rebar to the side didn't stop Laura. <laughs> Uh, this was preceded by yes what yes what yes what and i don't really know why but i swear to i swear to god bobby just like eats a whole bag of shrooms before he emails us and then just like looks at gifts for an hour to pick a gift 
a, a, a gift to send us and then it said yeah oh. and then he said uh uh because of chucky if you could get one horror movie greenlit for a series what would you pick also i didn't know chucky had been turned into a tv show were you aware of this because i was yes. not yeah, they I had not heard about this. They actually talked about it on Hollywood Babble back when it was first announced because I believe Mark Hamill is Chucky. I thought they had Brad Dorf back as the original because wasn't I Mark that Hamill? Was the movie. I'm pretty sure Mark Hamill was Chucky in the recent movie. And right, the maybe I've got the movie and the series backwards. I think I the know show Mark Hamill brought was back. Chucky for something. I know that I, I think the show was like bringing Brad Dorf back because Brad Dorf was the original one, I believe. But I'm not, I'm not like a Chucky expert, so I could be mistaken. But uh, do you have an answer for this, Mr. Ron? If you could get one horror movie greenlit for a series, what would you pick? I think if it was really well done by someone that could keep the spirit of the movie, I think The Thing would be an amazing miniseries, like a 10-episode miniseries on HBO. I could see that. Um, I think you could pull that out uh, pretty pretty easily like i said if it's done right um what about one that doesn't like recap it but like expands upon it because one that i thought of when i first read this was that uh, train to basan i think would make like a really cool show because you could do like different stories within that every season is a different mode of transportation <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah eventually get to, like a fucking go-kart <laughs> go-kart to, to basan <laughs> Um, I would watch that shit. Yeah, that's that would be great. Um, I want I want a series just if uh, if the one dude had survived, the dude that was just punching zombies in the face. Yeah, yeah. If he if he had survived and uh, made it out on his own, him and the world of uh, Train to Busan on his own, I think would be great. One that I really want that I think they've been at least talking about that I I really want to see is Event Horizon. I think you could do a lot of cool shit with Event Horizon that. Uh, has been kind of just untapped potential. I can cool see that. It's a cool setup, and uh, you you could uh, have more. You know, I'm always down for spooky shit in space, like Dead Space, mm -hmm. like one of our favorite games of the last twenty years. Like, fuck yeah, dude. How would uh, you feel about like uh, if someone took? Like say either like dog soldiers or like American Werewolf in London or or something, and pulled that out into like a like a ten episode miniseries. I'd be down. I'd you think do. a, you think a werewolf miniseries would get old, or do you think you could use that time to explore like what the main character himself is going through as a werewolf as he's like transforming and stuff yeah, and having yeah, to deal I, with that? I, I think you would have to make it kind of like uh i don't think you've watched any of his stuff yet but a lot of his stuff is in the short list for the show uh mike flanagan the guy who made haunting of hill house uh, midnight mass uh doctor sleep mm -hmm. that guy uh like with the haunting of hill house it is both like a horror show but it's actually more focused on kind of like the family elements and like the character dynamics so i, th I think if you had mm -hmm. the show function on that aspect, like you were talking about, like actually fleshing him out more as a character and making it more like where the werewolf part is a, an important aspect of it, but not the entirety that it, you know, is right. thrust upon. I, th I think you can make it work. You just have to be good characters. Yeah. Uh, Bobby wraps up his email by saying, P.S. About damn time El Royale is on the podcast. So Bobby is one of the five people in the universe that has seen it. Now. That has actually so seen you, the movie. Yeah. There you go. Good and is this and then, maybe... What, like the third movie we've covered he's actually watched? <laughs> Probably. Probably. <laughs> he tends to listen to all these without watching them, and I don't understand. Well, I, I mean, would we hate kinda, us if I did that. We just kind of, we kind of babble, and he probably just lets it go in one ear and out the other, so he probably has already probably. forgotten all the shit we've spoiled over these last 37 episodes, so. It's I can, true. I can, I can only hope. And then he ends the email by saying, PPS, love you. Love you too, Bobby. You're the best. <laughs> Thank you for always emailing in. We appreciate you, man. And let's get the rundown out of the way for Bad Times of the El Royale. Uh, Once again, a quick reminder, full spoiler warning, no holds barred. Indeed. Indeed. Written and directed by Drew Goddard, who I have always been a huge fan of and feel like doesn't get enough props. I mean, fucking 
wrote Cloverfield. You and I are big fans of the first Cloverfield. And he, did he Ten direct it too? No, no. Okay. He just wrote it. Who did direct Cloverfield? Oh, oh, he was directed by Matt Reeves. That's right. Okay, because that confused me. Because I, uh, I have Bad Times at the El Royale. Um, I have it on Blu-ray, but it came with a digital version that I redeemed through iTunes. Yeah, and that's what I watched. And if you look at like the cast, it tells you like what else they've done. Mm-hmm. And for um for Drew Goddard, it had Cloverfield in the list of things he directed. And I was like, I he directed Clo and what? I don't mm, I don't think so. But yeah. so his his directorial debut was Cabin in the Woods, which your first fucking movie you directed <laughs> being Cabin in the Woods. So now that I think about it, probably how he knew Hemsworth. Because Hemsworth probably, was in yeah. Cabin in the Woods. Uh as you know, dirt bikes and force fields. Yeah. He uh Man, Cabin in the Woods is really fucking great. Easily could be in the show. Ron needs to watch it again because he was shit faced out of his oh, mind dude. when I introduced it to him, so he I probably was remembers so none of it. Drunk. Uh, I think Drew Goddard has done one of the absolute best book adaptations as far as a script. Uh, the Martian. The is Martian really fucking is fucking good. So good. It's such a good adaptation. It and it like encapsulates everything that that character is meant to be, like the whole tone of it. Uh, the Golden Globes didn't understand it, but uh, <laughs> they uh, they fucking crushed it with that script. I think I think he did a great job. Yeah, right having here. read the uh, book before going in to watch the movie, which is something I don't usually do, but I I wanted to I wanted to read this book. Uh, yeah, I have to say, what uh, I was sad some of the stuff didn't make the cut to the movie, but I completely see cutting the things that were cut, and I totally see keeping the things that were kept and that script it, it's the book man it feels just like the book yeah he actually got an uh an academy award nomination for best adapted screenplay well done you know here he earned that because like, that was a great fucking script really really good because usually i'm the type too and i think you are too like if you're really into a thing and it's adapted from the book your brain starts to focus on what's not been included but when i was watching the martian i was just seeing the martian i, yeah. I was never actively nitpicking the movie I was just really enjoying how they captured like the spirit of it, you know. Yeah, yeah, no the the soul of that book is in that movie, and yeah, abso- absolutely. he deserves every award he can get for that adaptation. Yeah, I I one thousand percent agree. Hey, I know and how he... he got. Uh, I know how he got Cabin in the Woods because I'm seeing uh, he wrote five episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yeah, he is real, real good buddies with Mr. Whedon. So there you go. And, and it's interesting and too. It's interesting too. Uh, that this movie, this movie came out and it was just such a an unfortunate bomb. Uh, like we like we haven't been <gasps> hyperbolic. It was just really, Jeff. really. Yes, sir. Jeff, no, this is an emergency breaking news announcement. Oh, sh- oh shit. Okay. Are you are you looking at uh, Mr. Drew Goddard's IMDb page? Uh, I'm currently on the Wikipedia, uh, but I can scroll over to the IMDb. On his writing credits. Project Hail Mary screenplay announced. No shit. So he's adapting. I, uh, for those that don't know, Project Hail Mary is Andy Weir's current book. That's the person that wrote The Martian. So they brought him back to adapt Project Hail Mary because he did so go. good on The Martian. I still need to read the, the Project Hail Mary novel. I unfortunately have not. It's gotten very good. It. I don't know if it's for it, it's a lot. It's much more harder sci-fi and much less popcorn sci-fi like The Martian. Um, it goes into a lot of numbers and stuff, but, mm. um, I am all on board for him adapting that screenplay or adapting yeah. that book into a screenplay. Uh, I wish yeah, someone it, would do Artemis. I loved Artemis too. I liked it. Artemis a lot too. Uh, just, uh, man, Andy Weir is really good. I, I love too, just hearing about how his second uh novel was this magnum opus that he'd been working on for a really long time and eventually he just like you know what this is garbage and he just scrapped the whole fucking thing and just wrote <laughs> artemis and hail mary and everything it's pretty cool like i i respect that just like because i've been there he's like man this thing i've been working on for six months this is fucking trash <laughs> this just goes in the garbage <laughs> oh man uh but yeah no i am all down for drew goddard adapting yeah, I- I, yeah, I love me some Drew Goddard. I think he. I think he's, he's really doing good. the Sinister Six. He's writing the screen. Did, did they revive no, the Sinister Six? I, I don't think so. I think that's probably still the project that got shit canned. 
but it could because I don't know. Did the second Venom movie make any money? Because I know the first Venom movie surprisingly it made like was a, a very shit. successful. Yeah, I remember the first Venom movie made a shit ton of fucking money. I don't. I think wish it, the people. I wish people that went and saw fucking Venom could have gone and seen you know Bad Times of the El Royale. That'd have been nice. Oh, that would have really been nice. Yeah, I don't think it did as good as Venom because the times we're living in. Mm. But I think for pandemic numbers, I think it was number one at the box office. So it's like eight dollars. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, what's funny is all I ever heard about and through like news articles and things like that is just how great uh, Let There Be Carnage is. And then like only one of the podcasters I listened to saw it and he was like, yeah, it's garbage. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I, was, I wasn't that crazy about the first fucking bit of movie. I thought it was okay. I had a couple of funny scenes. Okay, I, we're, I, I we're here to talk about Bad know. Times at the Air Royale, but the one thing I want to say about the first Venom movie is... <laughs> I, I love how we got on those fucking... Some of the tangents. No, I just... I don't understand if... They were obviously planning Let There Be Carnage because of that end credit scene. Uh-huh. So then why was the villain of the first one another symbiote? If you're planning your sequel to be a symbiote. Um, I believe the word you're looking for, Ron, is unoriginality. <laughs> I'll take uh, an originality for 200. <laughs> yeah, I just I that was the part that just kind of blew me away when I saw the movie the first time and I was like, "Hold on. Is that is that not just going to be the same movie I just saw? The two CGI blobs smashing into each other oh, and I can't tell And not happening. only did they pick a symbiote, they picked another fucking like grayish blackish symbiote <laughs> in the fight and they're having them fight in the fucking dark. I might as well be watching a fucking Bayformers movie <laughs> trying to figure out what I'm watching. But at that point, I no longer cared. I just yeah. was like I was like, you know what? This movie's not bad. But I just don't care. <laughs> I just don't. But um, what I do care about is bad times at the El Royale. Uh as we talked about the the, the fucking cast in this movie. Oh my god, real, the cast. It's real fucking perfect. I, I don't even know who to begin with. Uh, let's just like Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges great. is where we start, of, sir. Of course he is. Has Jeff Bridges ever had a bad performance? I know I know some people have issues with some of his later roles where he got his like fucking true grit voice for a while, you know? He's like he's toned that down a little bit. He's an interesting but, person because he goes through these weird phases. Like when he started his uh cowboy phase, like he was in, like in real life, like he just walked around everywhere with a cowboy hat for no reason and stuff and boots, and then he was in like True Grit, and then like later he was in uh, um Kingsman: The Golden Circle, and he's a fucking cowboy in that. Like he goes through these phases of Hell or High Water, wasn't he? Yes, Hell or yeah. High Water. He's basically a cowboy in that. Like and he goes through his fits and in real life when he shows up to do interviews he's in like blue jeans boots and a fucking cowboy hat because he it, just he yeah. just gets stuck on a thing whatever's it, interesting him at the moment and that's the roles he does at the time it's as like well. his his method acting like spills into his own life for like ten years at a time he, he just I, I just want to have a beer with Jeff Bridges because he just sounds like a fascinating dude oh I know I would I mean I, I would probably just talk to him about the Big Lebowski for an hour so he'd hate <laughs> me because that's what everyone talks to him about probably but I would still do it because I couldn't help myself I think Jeff Bridges yeah. automatically elevates any project he's a part of I don't I think it's a Christopher Lee situation where like even if the thing you're in is bad doesn't mean you have to be bad in it and I think Jeff Bridges is always his best in every movie he's in even if what he's in isn't great or doesn't do great I was I funny to think about it too. The first villain in the MCU, Mr. Yeah. Bridges. Yeah. yeah, and Thor. Yeah. Yeah, we got Obadiah Stane and Thor in here. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. It's funny. Just like every fucking movie. It's like, you know, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. It just, you end up with fucking every person in Hollywood that's been in a Marvel well, movie. Well, at this point, the MCU is so big. How do these people not run into each other doing other projects? Yeah, it's, it's insane. Uh, we have. Uh, John Hamm, who I fucking adore. I he's still so, say, if we can't get a Carl Urban Batman, I want a John Hamm Batman. Oh, man, that'd be so good. Love me some John Hamm. I think his character in this is really cool, too. It's such a fucking misdirect, what happens with his character. It's, yeah. it's such a cool twist that I really like. Uh, and Cynthia I think Erivo, he, I think I think John Hamm, more than any other character in this movie, gets to play basically two different roles simultaneously. You know, everyone is basically not who they say they are in this movie, but I think that goes double for John Hamm yeah. in this movie. Yeah. Uh, Cynthia 
Arivo, Arivo, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Yeah. She's fantastic in this. She I, I love her in this. She's so good. This yeah, is she a is great. Yeah, she's great. Uh Dakota Johnson, I think, is good. Uh she doesn't have much to do. I think her character is kind of the least interesting of yeah. uh, as Emily. Uh just be, you know, because I mean it's not really her fault, just because everyone else is just so interestingly written, you know, that she, even though she's not a bad character, she's just kind of not interesting by comparison. Her but, character is basically used as a vehicle to get another character at the hotel later. Exactly. Exactly. It, it, she's more of a means to an end. But yeah, Dakota Johnson, I thought, did did great as that role. Just like you said, there's just not a lot for her to do. Yeah, she actually does a very good job considering how you know, quote unquote, underwritten she is compared yeah. to the other other characters. Uh, I, I also think uh, Kaylee Spaney, oh who my plays God. her sister, is so fucking creepy at this. And yeah, in Pacific Rim Uprising, easily my least favorite character. And I just, I don't, I don't understand it. How are you so good in here and so generic in, uh, in Uprising? Yeah, uh, maybe just directing. You know, maybe, maybe it could it was be God you, being you, able to. You know me, Jeff. Car uh, actors like that, that drives me insane because I know they have the potential. They just don't always use it. And she's, you know, in her defense, what is she, like 19? I know. She's still uh, playing you know, away. Julianne Moore like has fucking, no fucking excuse. 55-year-old Julianne Moore and Halle Berry who couldn't give less of a shit in like half their movies. You know? Yeah. Yeah. They, Let's see. Uh, uh, Lewis we Pullman. Lewis Pullman as as Miles is like probably like the unsung hero of the movie because I actually Absolutely. really like his character a lot. Yes, Miles I think is my favorite character of the movie. Such a cool and and I like the um the Mister X with his character's backstory too up until like the very end. Very his cool. character is intentionally very forgettable. Yeah, yeah. The entire point of Miles is that you literally forget he's in the room, and that is the point of his character. And then there's a turn <laughs> that I'm going to talk about in detail later. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, that is just like, oh, my God, Miles. Yes. And uh, what, gets, what gets higher billing between Chris Hemsworth, Chris Hemsworth, uh, his mustache, and Hemsworth, his uh, abs? What, what's... Uh, I, well, what, what? I think contractually, I think his abs have top billing, followed by him, and then the mustache comes and goes, depending on the project. I, I think Hemsworth probably has, like, a writer in his contract. If I'm going to be on your movie, I can't have a shirt on for half my seats. That's just <laughs> part of the thing. Uh, what, a, uh, what a performance from Chris I, Hemsworth I know. in this. I know. He's fucking batshit in this movie. And he's he's batshit, really... but also really... In almost a subtle way, creepy. Like, you're being creeped out by him, and you can't necessarily exactly put your finger on why, because he's more, he's more, uh, like, sociopathic and, like, kind of trigger-happy and just kind of out of control. But at the same time, there's something underneath that performance that just fucking creeps you out to watch him on screen. It's so and good. Think, and I think it's such a brilliant move picking Hemsworth for that role, too. Because it's just so far out of left field for everything else he does. He's always the, you know, like, the, the charming, likable guy. And in this, he is that. But just with all of these undertones. But in such a just, sinister way. In such a sinister and creepy and just unsettling way. And I think he does a, he does a great job. This, his, his character could really easily turn into being a cartoon. And I, th I think yeah. he keeps it from, from being that. Um, I'm trying to make sure I've got the name correct. Um, there is, uh, another film he did a while back. Um, I think it's, no. Uh, da, 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 da. oh my God, come on. He's used his, he only exists in the movie as a misdirect. Uh, um, Hemsworth? Yes. Uh, da, 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 da. yeah, this is it. Uh, a perfect getaway. Oh yeah, his like performance in this reminds me a lot of his performance in A Perfect Getaway, but in a much more, in a much more sinister way. He was kind of creepy and weird, and he only exists in that movie to make you believe he's the killer they're talking about on the radio and all the people are talking about. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out he's not, but he—that's literally the only reason his character is 
is in that movie. But that performance, like I said, um, mirrors this one a lot more. Just he's a lot more sinister, I think, in this great, one than he was. Great fucking name for a cult leader, too. Billy Lee. I can oh, just... my God. I know. Uh, also... You know, a lot of people always question, you know, like they, they look back to Manson because that's clearly what his character is inspired by is Manson. Yes. And, you know, you look at Manson and you listen to like interviews with him. And you're just like, how the fuck did he get people to follow him and do all this crazy shit? Now, if you look at Mr. Hemsworth, if Hemsworth in real life walked up to a group of women and was like, hey, y'all go stab this guy. About half of them probably would do it because it's fucking Chris fuck, Hemsworth. I'd do it. Exactly. You know, exactly. It's fucking Chris Hemsworth. You, Show you, me the of abs. Of course. Okay. Do you it's... have a knife or I need my own? <laughs> Oh man, it does. It does make a lot of sense, though. You know, because yeah. you, you you see people just like he's he's a fucking charismatic dude, and it, it makes sense. You know, you kind of you kind of buy how he's got this like just fucking murderous cult following him. You know, who is the character Sammy Wilds in this? Is this one of the cultists that follows Billy Lee? This I don't is remember. actually. I I believe he is uh, briefly in the movie. As the cell partner to Jeff Bridges in the flashback, oh. when he is waking up uh, with like the, the the dreams of you know where he wakes up kind of in like a state of not being able to remember. Yeah, you know? yeah, and one of his uh, Alzheimer fits. Yeah, because uh, I fucking love that dude from Constantine, which I still say is a show that should be on the air to this day. Agreed. As yeah, he, was he was fucking buddy, Chaz. right? Yeah, huh? yeah. He was his, uh, like the kind of co lead of it. Yeah, yeah, Chaz, like he, he can't die. He dies in every episode a different, terrible yeah. way and then wakes up. I love that. Yeah, he's Man, fucking great. Shit. And I saw him in this, and I was like, I'm sorry, who? I th I think it's because he just has that, that giant beard uh -huh. in the cell where he, it, you can if you go back and look, you can kind of tell that it's him, but he's now, just so briefly in it. You want to talk giant beards, because without his giant fucking beard, I'd never <laughs> realized Nick Offerman was in this was movie. Was his brother? Yeah. Yeah. I recognize him uh, just because of his voice. Uh, for just from watching Parks and Rec, I kind of recognize his voice. But yeah, he does look so different without either his giant fuck off cave. Because right now he has beard. that Peter Griffin bird beard. Yeah. Like he's got a nest of birds living in his beard. Because um, he had to have the he had to have the stash for ten years for Parks and Rec, so I think he's kind of venturing out. And then one of my favorite character actors, Jeff, Shea, Shea Wiggum. Wig Shea Wiggum. Fucking love Shea Wiggum. Dude. I didn't even get to the name before you did. Yeah. It's fucking Shea Wiggum, dude. Uh, You're so talking about good. someone who never in his life has turned into bad performance. That's Shea Wiggum. Yeah, I know. That dude, be, that dude will be, be in your movie. Stuff. That dude will be in your movie for 90 seconds. And Easily like, one of my top five, top three favorite characters in Kong Skull Island. Oh, yeah. He's awesome. <laughs> what is it? He, uh... Um, they they make the allusion to the uh, the mouse and the lion, and he's yeah. like, he's like, what? We're gonna make friends with this thing? He's like, no, the mouse kills the lion with the thorn, and he's like, yeah. And who told you that? And Shea Wiggum goes, my mom did, and he goes, yeah, that it, that explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking love Shea Wiggum, dude. Yeah, and we'll talk about some more of these characters throughout the uh, the, re the the review. But man, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, well, I, where I wanted to begin is, I had an interesting thought watching this. Is this movie, or is it not, a um, a, an anthology? It's definitely constructed like an anthology, but it doesn't I, play out like an anthology. I, I, and, okay, so so the thing we talked about earlier about how like a lot of people had issues with this being almost too much of a love letter to Tarantino is the inter it has moments where they cut back and forth within the same movie you know the, uh as far as they have we, flashback we rewind. sequences we rewind the movie to see events from a different angle from a different angle yeah and it's it's very very Tarantino uh i i think and he almost had to, but you know, the decision to stop the movie for a second and have the black screen with the white title card come up of like the next segment. That is a Tarantino esque thing. And but that I don't think also... it's an I don't think it's an anthology though, because it is all part of the same story. It's just Yeah. It's just interse like intersecting between different points it, of the story. It's like a weird in between because for the first so we spend the first act, basically introducing the characters. The second act, we kind of go between the rooms. 
And then the third act, like everything kind of happens all at once to everybody. Uh, but it's like you, um, it's like half anthology, whereas it's starting like room one, room four, maintenance closet. <laughs> and yeah. Just following these characters. And then there's a point where all of the loose strands kind of start getting tied together one at a time as it goes. So it, it's like a weird hybrid. It's like it starts out as an anthology and then moves into into something else. But I don't know. I, I just I was just curious your take on. I don't believe this movie is an anthology, but the more I was thinking about it, it's it's definitely built and layered like an anthology. You you know what it is? It's almost like half Tarantino, half like Agatha Christie. It's yeah. really weird. Yeah, it's got a little bit of whodunit going on. It's got the whodunit without the big reveal by the detective. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, but, and, and there's I actually um what is your take on okay so the El Royale uh, hotel they're staying at there he's kind of um on the nose a bit with like the the split dynamic of you know like literally half the hotel is California half of it's Nevada what what is your kind of take on that because it is like a little bit on the nose and I think that is one of the things people had an issue with is because it's kind of like not subtle about the themes you know. Which I don't really have a problem with personally, but I was curious, like, what you're kind of take on that. Explain. Uh, the, the idea of like so many of the characters being two face and the, the dynamic, like, with Hemsworth talking about, like, you know, like right and wrong. It's all kind of like symbolism, tying in with, literally the hotel being split in half. It's kind, it's kind of just uh, never once occurred to me. Uh, a lot of people complain about it being just kind of like um to like it like just the the lack of subtlety with it well they only talk about it they only address it the one time when you're introducing the characters it's just used as foreshadowing more than anything in that case yeah no one, I, no I, one, I, it, it never really, even comes up again i don't really have a problem with it but i, I feel like because the movie is in so, fact it, it's used as a really good vehicle to endear jeff bridges to uh to darlene i've already forgotten her name I'm going to keep doing this. Uh, Cynthia Erivo. I'm going to guess it's Erivo if, if I had to guess. But it's, it's basically used as a, as a foreshadowing tool in that case. Uh, that is a good observation. That's never once occurred to me in all the times I've watched it. Um, but it's also used as a vehicle for Jeff Bridges and Cynthia Erivo's characters to kind of endear themselves to each other because they talk about, like, I've never been to uh, California. What's it like? And they're just standing on the other side of this divider line. Um, but yeah, no, I I don't have anything to uh to say about that because I've never thought about it. Cause, because like I think one of the reasons that people like really just kind of because it didn't review poorly, but I think it didn't really get the respect that it deserves, and I, I it's almost like people were distracted by the, the like the Tarantinoisms of it, and not really like realizing just how like different it is from a Tarantino movie, and the fact that like most of these characters actually feel like real people. Yes characters in a tarantino movie are always just tarantino characters and i fucking love them you know because they're, they're always they're awesome kind of a caricature of like a they're, stereotype or something they're they're, they're just like over stylized yeah you know they're designed to be the coolest person in the room instead of a, an and that's not a being. bad thing i mean it's that, like, yeah it's it's just it's you just know. you know you know it's apples and oranges yeah but but i feel like you know this movie has actually really interesting like mr x with some of the characters i think the way that Jeff Bridges is actually initially shown to be kind of like a sinister character. And then that's a twist too, that he's not really, you know, yeah. he's, he's a, he's a bad dude, but he's, you know, when you see him pull out the little the canister, bottle. the bottle, and, you know, your brain immediately starts to jump to like conclusions that isn't actually what's happening. But I think it's very interesting in how they lead you to believe some of these characters are going to be evil when they're not. Uh, they present people to be forgettable, like miles, even though, he has an incredibly tragic backstory and is very interesting. It's just he's not at the forefront of the movie until the very end, you know. Right. So, so it's all it's like it's like sleight of hand and who they choose to show, when they choose to show uh, backstories. It's like the movie is basically it's not just playing with um, the characters and like the duality of you know people or these characters, or whatever. But it's also playing with the fact that you have seen a movie before. Yeah. 
you know, and you have certain expectations when you see characters doing certain things on screen. There's certain conclusions you jump to because that's just the way movies are. Movies usually have a, a through line with certain types of characters. You've seen all of these types of characters in movies before, and it's using your experience with those archetypes against you. And I fucking love the misdirect with John Hamm's character. Yes. It's like John Hamm misdirects is misdirects you like three times with him. Jo John Hamm, you are almost certain, is going to be like the main character. Because yes. they spend so much time with him in the first 20 minutes and show him, you know, as like the FBI agent undercover, you know. Yeah. Oh, he sees, he sees the girl that's been kidnapped, you know. And it, it just looks like, you know, your, your brain starts to connect the dots, just like you said. You've seen the movie before. You think it's going to be about John Hamm, you know, trying to, you know, get back up. You know, it's going to be just kind of like little cookie cutter crime drama with an undercover FBI dude. And, and he's fucking this, killed within like the first like 30 minutes of the movie. It's Yeah. Kind of and nuts. this was uh, 2018. It came out like we're still in the middle of kind of like John Hamm fever at the moment. Right. Like what? Mad Men's just ended and he's breaking into movies. When was Baby Driver? Like that was one of the big deals yeah. that John Hamm was in Baby Driver. I think it was the year before. I believe Baby Driver 2017. Yeah, so uh, we're yeah. we're all still very much talking about John Hamm regularly and it kind of sets him up to be the lead of the movie. He's going to be our hero. He's the FBI agent at this shady hotel. And then yeah. he gets blown away through a fucking mirror. <laughs> it, it, yeah, point blank. Yeah. Uh yeah, by by Dakota like fucking Fifty Shades of John Ham just go all <laughs> over the fucking mirror, man. It's bad. Well done, Dakota Johnson is in those movies. Yeah, well done. A a and when that happens, I think you and I probably both either said it out loud or we're thinking like, "What the fuck?" Because I, like I think really... I just yelled "fuck" out loud in the theater because it is. It's brutal. It's brutal, and it's actually like a pretty realistic representation of what would likely happen you know because he doesn't get like ex you know he doesn't explode like he's in like a schwarzenegger movie it's just <laughs> right. brutal you know it's it's yeah. it's kind of understated there in is a, really, a like, splash yeah it's but, just kind yeah. of understated in a way that's makes it more unsettling and, and real and man when that happens and it's such a good misdirect too because it's like all bets are off you know yeah you don't know what you're watching you don't know who's gonna make it also, that leads into one of my favorite camera angles of the movie because it's just looking down that hallway behind all the mirrors and you just see the shotgun come through and then her leaning through and just, what the fuck? And what then it the cuts. Fuck, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I love that creepy-ass hallway, too. I love how it's like, it's. I mean, it makes sense. You wouldn't want to put light in there, but, you know, then that mirror is a, a window. But, yeah, uh, that creepy-ass, dark, just concrete hallway. It's almost like a bunker. Yeah. It's it's so bleak and it makes sense because, you know, it's fucking nefarious shit happening in this hotel. Dude, I uh, One of the things that's it's kind of funny also, um, but it's also telling you this hotel is not what it seems, is when uh, John Hamm is in his room and he's retrieving the FBI's own bugs, but finds other bugs. Like 20 just, of them. And they're just all over the fucking room. He just keeps yeah. pulling one after the other. When that, and then when he has he, that scene where he just has them laid out on the table and there's like 50 <laughs> fucking recording devices. And then he, uh, when he is pacing out the length of the building as opposed to the length of the room, and he figures out that there's got to be like a hallway behind the mirror. Yeah. It is really cool. So we use him as a vehicle to figure out this hotel is not on the up and up, and then we off him basically it's so good it's uh, yeah, you, it's you, you know good. you know i fucking love protagonist switching if it's done intelligently and this is really really well done i love it i was absolutely fucking shocked when he got killed uh, when we first saw it in the theater but that being said i am also kind of sad that vacuum cleaner john ham vacuum cleaner salesman john ham was not a thing through more of the movie <laughs> because his cover as the it, vacuum it, cleaner salesman yeah. is so good yeah, he's got it's, it's like the uh, uh, I'll take this room. You're fucking kidding me. And he's got <laughs> all, all the way through it, he has that kind of like South Carolinian fucking <laughs> dude. When he, out looks, accent. when he looks at Cynthia Arrivo, it's just like you in the hospitality business, like oh my god. Yeah, and he has that fucking devastating line to her about uh i bet you have some uh you know friends that are in need of a vacuum cleaner it's like oh, oh my god oh my god he says so, it with that that used car salesman smile the entire yeah, time and that fucking accent that he has 
But dude, when Dakota Johnson walks in and then she like he's ready to help the next person and she looks at him and he just goes, "Be my fucking guest." <laughs> like the way he <laughs> says it. Yeah, it's like his cover is just to be a massive fucking prick to everybody to like uh, make them like just not want to talk to him and, and interact with him more. It's pretty, yeah, to make people ingenious. want to naturally avoid him. Yeah, it's pretty ingenious, you know, just be a fucking asshole about it and people will avoid talking to you. <laughs> Does no one see or respect my accoutrements sitting here? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. He says the word accoutrement like five accoutrement. times in a span of ten minutes. I don't think I've ever heard that word that much in my life. Yeah. It's it, so it, good. And I like how they're always having to to wait just because Miles is just constantly just blasts out of his mind in the maintenance closet. And I love that the, the fucking title card later, like you said, was maintenance closet. Maintenance closet. Fucking genius. I love that. One of my that. favorite callbacks to the beginning of the movie it's when Jeff Bridges and Cynthia Erivo are going to go get some food. And Jeff Bridges starts to ring the bell and then stops and goes, why even have a bell? Yeah. <laughs> oh, one thing I noticed, too, when, uh, when we were watching it today, did you notice that when they have the like interstitial title cards, the designs on the border on the corners of the screen are different? To, they're, they like, are assigned not. To, they're, 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 they're assigned to, like, characters. Uh, Are they really? Yeah, if you go back and watch it. So uh, I noticed that later on, when they introduce Hemsworth, uh, when they cut it's to Billy Hammers. Lee, he he has little um, sunflowers as the borders in the top left and right, uh, and you know just the corners of the screen. And when they do Jeff Bridges, they intersect in crosses, you know, like because he's a priest. It's really right. cool. Hadn't noticed that. So watch that next time you watch it. It's pretty cool. I, uh, man. I'm trying to Google yeah, you, it, but I only found room five. I can't find the other ones. Yeah, uh, but they, they are all uh, individually assigned to the, the character, which I thought was a really, really cool touch. That, I am sad. Oh, room one, it's the plaid from his jacket in the corners. Mm -hmm. Room five is Darling Sweet, and it looks like audio waves uh, Super blasting cool touch. out. Yeah, Washington, D.C. is one of the cuts. Uh, room seven was uh, Emily and Rose, and it's like flower, uh, like leaves, like from like a like a rose. Um, uh, yeah. Room four was Jeff Bridges. That's the crosses. Billy Lee is the sunflowers. Maintenance closet is just as bare as it can be. <laughs> and then Reno, Reno is a combination. Oh, dude, this is so cool. What was I the Reno like, one? Uh, Reno one is uh, Darlene Sweet, and um, it's like Darlene Sweet mixed with the maintenance closet one. Like it's here. I'm just gonna give you this link that I found, and okay. I want this in the show notes. Uh, is this is pretty? This is pretty slick because I didn't notice it. Uh, da -da -da. I'm gonna send it to you here so you can. Yeah, it was it was a detail I I really liked because uh, I I'm gonna put it I'm gonna post it. Great, I've never noticed know? it. <laughs> oh God. Don't ever go to Crutched, you know. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's pretty slick. Uh, I'm sad that I missed that. Yeah, because they're they're very subtle about it. It's not in your face, which is one of the things that I appreciate, but also why I missed it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Super cool. Huh. The more you know. <laughs> do 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 do. Um. Let's see. So we've talked about uh, John Hamm. Do we want to talk about Jeff Bridges now? Yeah, let's let's talk about Jeff Bridges. Because another thing, too, I want to talk about is just I like the opening of this movie. It starts out as essentially a prologue for Jeff Bridges' character, and the framing of it is so cool. It's, like, detached from the frame, almost like a you're watching a stage play. Um, and, and, then you're, and then you realize that that's foreshadowing the hallway. Yes, it's, you're through, watching through from the, the mirror. mirror. And and you don't realize that when you're first watching it, and I I think that's such a cool bit of foreshadowing. You yes, know, that, that the to the hallway. It, it so really cool. does give like a stage play air to it. And yeah, because it's it's even more detached. Because like you know, you end up watching sequences from characters, you know, looking through the one way mirror, and it's still not that detached. You know, it just feels so, it feels like like you're watching like from first row in like Broadway. Yeah, and and it's just like a, a cool, like a just way to present the, 
the movie and, and open it up because you're just like it's it's almost like initially unsettling just because of the framing you know it's pretty cool and the fact that you don't understand what you're seeing you just see this guy tear apart his hotel room and drop a, a bag that you presume is money or something uh into the floor and then start putting it back together and then just get blown the fuck away yeah um and you're just like what is happening i think you get the your title card at that point right is that yeah, when you get the title card? I think it's after he gets killed, and then they right. hard cut to the title card. And then, oh, the, the the music selections of this movie is also very good. Oh, dude, the music in this movie is one of the best soundtracks. It's so good. It's it's used perfectly. Like when 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 they're, they're used, used to foreshadow to be... things too, or to accent what is happening or what you know about a character. Like they're very specifically picked. Yeah, it's fantastic. And uh, the songs that they have, Cynthia Revo sing. Mm-hmm. are always great um man such a great soundtrack love it and and also like i love these types of period piece like crime thrillers you know set yes. like the 60s and 70s it's always a, it's a cool time to have it set for that type of a genre i think but yeah with with a uh, with jeff bridges um you know he's he's initially shown to be just incredibly shady He's, you know, you know, he's playing a priest, but he, they, they start to just give up like, like red flags all over the place, you know, that he's not. And I just, I just, I love that where they have, you know, cause he's talking with, uh, with Darlene at one point in the middle of the movie breaks off to pour her a drink and he just pulls out, you know, the bottle and you're, you're just praying to all the worst conclusions. And when you really like just learn more of his backstory and how, yeah, he was a fucking, you know, bank robber. Yeah, he is kind of a piece of shit, but, but he's, he's one of the good ones. <laughs> yeah, he's a bank robber with a heart of gold. You know, he's fine. Yeah, yeah he's fine. like he didn't want the armored car drivers hurt, and he's like yelling at the guy about that. And you know, it turns out he's uh, drugging Darlene Sweet, so he doesn't have to hurt her, so he can just get access to her room. Not a euphemism, and <laughs> look for the money because yeah. he has Alzheimer's, and I want more heist movies with a character that has Alzheimer's because. What an interesting twist to his character, knowing that the score of a lifetime, no one ever gives a dollar amount to it, which is a smart thing. Um, but the, the score of his lifetime is in the floor of either Hotel Room 4 or Hotel Room 5, and he cannot remember. And he has a 50-50 shot and guesses it wrong. <laughs> so yeah. now Darlene is between him and his money. And he doesn't want to hurt her. He likes Darlene, so he's gonna drug her. She uh to uh Father Daniel Flynn's uh chagrin, I guess. Uh Darlene sees him doing this and just clubs him over the head with a bottle. And that sound effect will haunt Oof. me. It, it's 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 edited and shot so well too, because it comes out of nowhere. Yes. And, and you're just and, and again, it's almost like the John Ham thing. You know, your your brain starts to connect the dots and your brain starts to proceed into scenes that could happen because of what's what, because of what you're seeing that don't happen because they immediately cut like all of your expectations out the window, which is, which is cool because Drew Goddard's able to do that because you can just tell Drew Goddard has seen a bajillion fucking movies in his life. Right. Like he, he knows the audience uh, expectations, you know, before they're going to happen. And he plays with that, but not, in, not in an annoying way, like in a clever way. Because in a lot of ways, these characters still fall into the traps that you expect them to, just not in the way you expect them to, or not the trap you thought they would. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he um, his backstory of being a uh, robbing the armored car and then taking the fall, so his brother and his other buddy can get out, and then that guy double crosses his brother. And then he gets out of prison. He's the only one left. I don't think they ever talk about what happened to the other guy, but he's the only one left. He was in jail for, what, 10 years? But he's got Alzheimer's now. Shea Wiggum tells him that. He's the doctor in the prison. Um, and it's always fun in a period piece to see the doctor like smoking in the room with patients, by the way. Uh, yeah. The, yeah, the uh, fact that that was ever allowed for any reason. Yeah, uh, I had a conversation about that with uh, Aurora as we were watching it, too. That she was immediately like, ha, smoking doctor. It, but what occurs to me, though, when I see that is I'm just like, man, 
Really? When was the last time you saw anyone smoking on screen? Like, it's, yeah, that's not a thing it, that I see that often anymore. Cause, and again, like, one thing that I actually think makes this in some ways better than some of the Tarantinoisms is, uh, you know, Drew Goddard's not afraid to show how, like, fucked up this time period was. You know, he's, it's not like this overstylized love letter to the time period, like a lot of Tarantino stuff is, you know, you know it's pretty much just uh, portraying it like it was, you know, John Am. You don't know how much of like what John John Ham says is him playing it up for his character, or how much he could, just could have really been a piece of shit. You know? Yeah. You don't know because that's just at the time period. Because it's it's set. They never give an exact year, but it's during the Vietnam War, so it's either like the like nineteen sixty nine, very early seventies, kind of in that range. Nixon's in office. You know? You just. I, I don't think you ever. Thought I saw somewhere pinned it down at nineteen seventy two. But now everything I'm looking at says early 1970s, so I don't know where I saw that. But I saw that when I was getting ready to watch it. Uh, specifically, something specifically said 1972. Oh, d- yeah. I, if the, if they do exactly give a year, I they don't, I don't in recall. the movie, which is why I guess I'm bringing it up. But yeah, I, huh? Yeah, but I don't know where I saw that. But I I, li- I like that about the film that they. They're not showing you the time period through rose tinted glasses, you right. know. They're, they're they're just showing it the way that it was, and it makes it more real. And I think it gives a lot a lot more depth to the characters. Well, I also like, like you said, that it's not just in your face with everything. Like, hey, remember the seventies? Like constantly, it, it just it just happens like, to be um, an interesting point that it is set in this time. It doesn't really call attention to itself, and. In not calling attention to itself, it kind of does. It's a weird, um, it's a weird circle that that runs in. But yeah, it, it, it's not throwing it at you in your face. It's just set in this time period, and it just runs with it. It's like you remember we talked about we were covering Crystal Skull about how Spielberg could not have oh more God. of a fucking boner for the 1950s. I'm just like Spielberg. I get it. Calm down, buddy. Yeah, I know. Gonna Refrigerators hurt used to be lead. Got it. Yeah. I like how this is, like you said, just subtle about it. It's just there. It's not in your face. It's not over the top. And it never becomes annoying like period piece type uh, material can be if they go overboard with it. And this is just really, really uh, well done. And it's also important, too, because they kind of need to have it set in this time period to make uh, Hemsworth more of like a Manson parallel, I think. Right. So, and so the, that's another the thing Manson too. Manson murders that they do with the how, rose. How fucking wild is it that this movie ends up being about a a murder cult ran by Thor? Yeah, that's pretty <laughs> fucking wild. I'm sorry. Can you run that by me again? <laughs> I was we were watching it earlier tonight, and you know they have like the bonfire scene where Hemsworth just has the fucking Thor cult ladies just duke it out for fucking no reason. Yeah, and I just said Asgard got weird. <laughs> Let's have ourselves an allegory. It's so... Dude, he's such a fucking interesting character to be. Like, it shouldn't work. He should just be like a fucking cartoon, but it's always just unsettling. When he fucking says that whoever wins gets the opportunity to sleep with him that night in, like, the big house or whatever he said, it's so gross, dude. Oh, it's so gross. It's so gross. But, I'd fight. (laughs) (laughs) Just putting that out there. Yeah. It's worth what a, it. What a fucking weird ass movie this is. But but oh, again, it, it it like you talked about in the opening of the podcast, if you if you just go Which at one? face <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> at, 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 like you said at the beginning of one of these podcasts we recorded tonight. <laughs> um if you go and read the Wikipedia synopsis, it sounds it's like fucking all over the place, but I don't get like whiplash watching the movie. It all flows yeah. pretty well when you watch it. And not like it's it's wild when shit you know takes a turn, but it's not like uh, you're ever confused or lost. I I think they do a really good job with the editing and keeping you kind of centered, even though you're switching so many perspectives. You're getting multiple backstories. You know, I was thinking about that because it's interesting how many movies hold your hand too much. And for too long, and it gets really annoying, like you're being talked down to by the movie or the people that wrote the movie. Yeah. Um, 
then there are movies that it's just like, okay, well, you could have held my hand a little, right? Uh, this movie does it pretty much the perfect amount. Because if we didn't rewind in time and review from a different perspective, it just assuming that you know that these events were happening simultaneously uh, would have been too much because there's too much going on. So it does hold your hand a little bit in that aspect, but it's like the perfect amount. And it, otherwise the, you would get lost and the idea of the one way mirrors is such a good plot device to be able to show s shit simultaneously yeah with without making it not work like not like it makes it still like work kind of organically you, you know like we talked about earlier like for the, the scene where you know jeff bridges is able to figure out a lot of shit that's going on which then leads to uh, because he's, you know he's in the the fucking uh dungeon hallway <laughs> <laughs> and you know and it watches they, poor Miles get blown away. Yeah, I like that. I like that uh, Dakota Johnson line later, where you know he's uh, he's uh, Miles is tied to the chair and uh -huh. he's talking. It's like you know you you didn't have to shoot me. He's like technically, I shot the dude in front of you who had it coming. And, you know you just happened to be on the, like in the wrong place, at the wrong time, or whatever. You just it's happened to be bad to being all creepy or whatever. It is <laughs> yeah, saying. yeah. She she has a lot of uh, really really smart ass lines that I think are are funny and delivered well. Yeah, no. Let's uh, talk. Let's let's talk about uh, what is her crazy ass sister's name? Rosie. Rose. Man, she's fucking creepy. She's so wild. Uh, that uh, it's when when Miles is saying, "You don't have to kill me. I don't even know your names yet." And then she fucking introduces their names to him just to have her sister have a better reason to kill him. She's so fucking like just sinister. In this. I know. Yeah, yeah. It's. It, you you can just tell she's so fucking brainwashed by and the. How good is Miles in that scene? Oh, he's As amazing. He's, he's participating in the conversation, like trying to be as hospitable as possible because he's in the hospitality business, while simultaneously trying to come to terms with the fact that he's about to be murdered, and he's already been shot in the face. He needs more roles. That guy's great, and that I haven't guy is seen great. him. His in, IMDb like... page is so short. Yeah, I, I haven't seen him in. Uh, I I meant to watch the Catch Twenty Two show that he's in, but I just never got around to it. Uh, but man, he's great in this. I I just think he uh. He he really sells those man when he's, when he's talking throughout the movie, on your first viewing, you know, talking about all the bad shit that he's done, and then when when you watch the movie a second time and you understand how he's referring to you know all the people he killed in, in the Vietnam War, it's like man, it, it hits you. Really yeah. differently on, on rewatch. I was trying to figure out, we didn't really understand PTSD in the 70s yet, right? But that wasn't really considered a mental disorder yet that needed to, that could be yeah. helped and could be fixed or not necessarily fixed, but teach the person how to deal with it and how to live a normal life with it. Um, I don't think we really understood that yet. I want to say the Vietnam War is where we started to kind of understand it. At least start to acknowledge it. I, I feel like we always figure out that it's a yeah. thing and they're not just like a white, a weak person or a weak constitution or something that yeah, this shit does, does do things to you. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a serious issue. And even to this day, it should be taking more, you know, seriously than it is in a lot of instances, unfortunately, but baby steps, I guess. Uh, let's talk about too. Um, I, I really like the, the way that they have the flashbacks but the, their positioning of the flashbacks, I think, is really is really smartly done. Uh, when they kind of take moments to have a, a backstory, it doesn't feel like it grinds the movie to a halt. Like mm -hmm. it very well could be in you know like lesser it, written. It's stuff. usually information that you want, and it usually shows up right around the time I want it. Like yeah. it's really odd and almost uncanny. Like the way I'm, this movie's manipulating me, Jeff. Because by the time I'm like, God, I wish I knew something more about that. It would cut into backstory about it. Like, as soon as I have that thought. Yeah, and they... The way that they give you just enough of a hook for for certain characters to keep you interested in learning more about them, and they just kind of, like, slowly start, you know, divvying out info throughout the movie, but you never feel, like, irritated that it's almost like too far up its own asshole, you know, to actually just be a fucking movie. It, it, it's, it's like, it is, you know, very intricately written, but it, it doesn't, 
it doesn't come across as like a pretentious movie, which this could have because right. of the subject matter and because you know it's it, it is like a like a noir crime thriller. A lot of people get into like fucking Tarantino, you know, James Cameron mode of just like I'm I'm the smartest James fucking Cameron. man alive while writing this. Yeah, uh, it really raises the bar over James Cameron. Yeah, um, it really does. But it remains like it's it's like a it's a stylized noir movie that's still grounded and not right. It, ne- it never loses its way like a lot of other movies in the genre can. One of the things that I thought was almost masterclass in the way it uses information against you is you talked about flashbacks. The flashback for Darlene Sweet's backstory is entirely giving you the wrong pers- um the wrong idea about Darlene. Like it kind of makes her look like weak or meek. And by the end of this movie, she's just fucking had it, dude. Like, she's not weak. She's not meek. She has learned lessons from the shit that's happened in her past and from dealing with shit. But, like, the way she deals with, like, the music producer and stuff gives you this this idea of what kind of person she is. And then it turns out you're wrong. And she has that one great line um, referring to Billy Lee. He talks so much, he thinks he believes in something, but really, he just wants to wants to fuck who he wants to fuck. And she's staring him in the eye the entire time she says this. And I think he he had already shot Dakota Johnson. At and this he point had already too. shot Dakota yeah. Johnson. And, and, and she she is able to immediately take control of the room, like yes. Chris Hemsworth. And he Chris Hemsworth even tries to respond after you know. And she shuts him down. She he, she shuts him down, and you can tell immediately she she got under his skin. You know, yeah, it he, was the sh- ultimate power play because people like Kimsworth's character in this, they always have the power in the room. That's the thing that gives them their power. People give it to them, and her not giving it to him, and then actively taking it away in front of not only the other people in the room, but some of them are his own followers watching this. Yeah, like dude. She has like the Darlene has like the ultimate power play of the movie when he goes to respond and she just shuts him down and says, Don't want to hear it. I'd rather listen to the rain. I'd rather listen to the rain. It's so good. God, oh my that's God, dude. And, and, also, and also, yeah, she's she's amazing. She's she's gonna start appearing in more stuff. She's also very good in, um, I think it was The Outsider. Did you ever watch the, I believe it was her in that? Let me just double check. Yeah, did you ever watch The Outsider on HBO? It was the uh, no. the Stephen King adaptation. Mm-mm. Super good. She plays uh, one of the main characters in that. She's also fucking awesome in that show. I really like her a lot, and I'm I'm glad she's starting to get um uh, more recognition. Yeah, because she's she's fantastic. Dude, that this. whole that whole scene, she kind of steals it. You know, up until we get to Miles. <laughs> there, there, yeah, let's talk about the roulette scene because the roulette scene. The in this roulette movie, scene is so good. Uh, oh, also, Ron. The ending of this movie is so fucking packed. I th- I would have told you and bet my life on it that the roulette scene was the final like ten minutes of the movie. Yes, because it's so jam packed, but it happens so fast and it's so intense. They're in the roulette scene for the final thirty minutes ish of the movie. Jesus. Yeah, because I, I, I remember movie looking at is, the clock. This movie is two hours and twenty one minutes long, and it always feels like thirty minutes to me. Yeah, it it just goes by in a flash, and it's really really well paced. And it, yeah, it it does not feel like as half as long as it is. It's it's excellently paced. Uh, paced. And I just um was blown away when I just happened to pause it at some point to do something while we were watching it on on like <laughs> Apple TV or whatever. Left. And I yeah, they're sitting at the roulette table, and they're still fucking like thirty five minutes after the movie. Like what the fuck? Because <laughs> it didn't it didn't feel like that back when watching the theater. But yeah, man, just. We alluded to it earlier, but the the just the weird fucking dance moves and the way that Chris Hemsworth, you know, <laughs> is creepy, while but also he he maintains that charm yeah. that you understand why the, people would follow him. Him after she turns on the jukebox, him like is it is it Jeff Bridges? He's dancing around, like. That dance always makes me laugh, but in like an unsettled, like creeped out way. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Because I'm you're laughing, laughing in an uncomfortable way at it. 
you're laughing as if you were watching the TV screen. If you were tied to a fucking, you know, <laughs> chair, right, by a cult, and the dude in in Hemsworth, you know, has a gun, you know, it, it would be a very, very terrifying thing because it's it's just a power play, but it's a it's a power play in this just very, very specifically bizarre way, which also makes sense because you know they're basically a sex cult. You know, half the fucking people at the bonfire are naked. You know, yeah. And it just all makes sense, you know, that that is how he expresses, like, dominance over the people, you know? Like like we talked about earlier, the fucking prize for winning the, the what does he call it, a, a, a tussle? Is that what he calls yeah, the let's fight have between the girls? Yeah, ourselves a tussle. Let's have ourselves a tussle, you know, is getting to sleep with them. It's just a fucking creepy sex cult. Those, those type of people, man, and even in real life, it's just about the control. And they're never the people they think they are, which is why I love that he gets his, his shit kicked out of him like a 70 year old alzheimer's patient mm-hmm. <laughs> and he can't do anything about it he can't overpower jeff bridges at all i love how they foreshadow jeff bridges being able to fight too yes because it, it happens in, in the shay wiggum scene yeah you know, he's talking about he he got into a fight in the prison you know about and shay wiggum just casually talks about yeah i don't know if that that young dude down the hallway is gonna be ever, ever able to walk again he's just like you know he came at me first <laughs> yeah it's just a badass. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He can hold his own, apparently. And then, you know, the uh, the ripped cult leader just gets his ass handed to him by an old man. And it's great. It's Be- awesome. Because, you know, he's not who he says he is. Shocker, the cult leader is not everything that he's made out to be. Mm-mm. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's amazing. I, I didn't know Obadiah Stane could fight so well without a suit of armor, dude. Yeah. Kick some ass. Yeah. Took down Thor. You know, you yeah, gotta give it to him. Put down the God of Thunder. Who's the real God of Thunder here? <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, uh, that whole roulette scene. One of the reasons that I love the fact that that scene is as long as it is, is again, that plays into the type of character Hemsworth is playing. Because it's all about control. He's not, it is about the life and death, the fact that he has all the power in the room. But the reason he would drag that out is just because he wants everyone to know that he is in control of what is happening. So, you know, making them play a game and everything that yeah, the man. dancing around them and everything that he's doing. When he when he literally decides to kill Dakota Johnson because yeah. of the roulette choice is is it's like it's like a Joker move, you know. Yeah. It, it's really good. Let's talk about Miles. We got to talk about Miles. We got to talk about Miles, dude. Yeah. <laughs> man, I can't kill no more people. <laughs> This 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 whole and his his performance too is it uh Lewis Pullman yes was that his name I believe so when he goes into fucking Call of Duty murder mode three sixty no scope man uh, d- dude when he is like people get behind cover and shit and he still just like casually you know he one or two taps he shoots a woman them. through a chair like she's hiding behind a booth and he just puts two bullets through the booth and she falls over dead from behind the booth. When the last person outside oh, dude. is actively taking cover behind the fucking car. As soon as his in- head pops up right between the eyes. Man. Like, he's pretty much one shot, one kill every time. And the thing that I really love, though, is he says that line twice. Like, he's sitting there like, I can't kill no more people. That one's for you. That one's for the audience to be like, huh? What did he just say? And then, now that you've had that moment, he says it a second time. That one's for the characters on screen because that's when Darlene's like, how many people have you killed, Miles? <laughs> because she didn't hear it the first time. She's still yelling for him to help them. It's the yeah. second time he says it that she hears it and say, how many people have you killed? And it cuts to Vietnam. <laughs> and dude, yeah, he's the last person standing on the battlefield and he's just pulls up his rifle and you can tell he's snapped. Like you can tell nobody's home. The light, no, The lights are not on upstairs. He's just reflexively pulling up the gun, one shot, one kill, next cartridge, one shot, one kill, next cartridge, just over and over and over and over. But when he he fucking kicks the gun up John Wick style into his hand, you're just oh, like, all oh. right. All right. So fucking good. murder machine, dude. And this is it's the so character good. that is literally designed for you to forget that he's in the room, even when he's on screen. And you do, so good. for the most part. For the most part, you forget all about Miles throughout the movie. Over, He seems like such a throwaway character. And then he just starts murdering everyone. <laughs> yeah. And, and because he's pretty much just killing the cult people, you're just like, fuck yeah, Miles, get it. You know, it's, yeah. it's awesome. 
And it's like so tragic too, because he's been trying to confess his sins to Jeff Bridges this whole time. And then to just see him, like you said, John Wick the rifle into his hands like it's a goddamn skateboard. And then to just go around, like I said, one shot, one kill. And that, I think you and me in the movie are the two people outside with the car, dude. I think I'm the guy standing. You're the one that's just like, holy shit, they killed Ron. And then when you pop your head up, you're <laughs> the guy that gets gets it second. Yeah, pretty much. Um, that's, that's us. Yeah, that's totally us. Uh, but yet, yeah, that whole thing. The whole thing, and then the fact that he's, he's, he seems, like I said, he seems like a throwaway character because he's, he's got this job, he's made to do shady shit, he's a heroin addict, um, he's trying to confess the sins, and you're assuming he's talking about the stuff he's done at the hotel for quote-unquote management, and all this stuff, and it's just all a big Mr. He's the biggest badass in the room, but his PTSD is so crippling that he's using heroin to numb it, and he's just completely shattered as a human being and he just can't really function anymore with what he's doing at the hotel plus uh being in the war and then he just snaps back into soldier mode like a r- goddamn well, rubber band well it's important too for his character w- uh, why he snaps when he does uh yes. because he he can't react when when darlene is asking him to help you know it, but when it's, she tells it's, him it's it has okay, to, he doesn't have to. Yeah, when it becomes a choice for him to help them, he can do it, but he just can't be because he was he was forced into killing people as a soldier. Right, it was his job. So it, 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 you know, and when he was a kid, he was forced into shooting the animals. Uh, was it like shooting like uh birds? Right, right. as a little kid, just because he was it be literally just because his mom and his mom's friend realized he was a crack shot, so they were just getting entertainment from him killing the birds. You know, just because he just happened to be very good at shooting. You know, right. It was his whole thing. He was just like forced into all of this shit just because he was good at it. And it wasn't until it became his choice to help them that he could do it. Yeah, which is it's it's a cool character moment, I, I think, for him. And, and like just like you said, I think it's cool too, how you're watching one of the main characters of the, of the entire movie throughout the, the the entire show without even realizing it until the, the end, you know, when he's you know, it's important that he's tied to the you know the roulette table with them at the end you know he, he has appeared like a supporting character when he's really not he's you right. know he's one of the major characters in the, the whole thing and his character flaw is his guilt because that's what gets him rose doesn't react to her sister being murdered in front of her but goddamn thor getting shot with a silver bullet or whatever and <laughs> getting killed that's when she pulls out the knife and dude it's bad enough watching the knife go into his stomach, but when oh, she guts yeah. seem like a fish. Right to left. Yeah, yes. Man. It's yeah, it's hard to watch. Oh my god. And his character flaw is just being human. I mean, think about that for a minute. Yeah. That's what gets him killed. Is his guilt over killing other people. It it, it almost ends up being like a, a mercy to him though it is yeah because I think that's the way it's supposed to be seen yeah b- because he's just he's just gone you know yeah. it's he, he's just it's he just can't live with it things. anymore and he can't yeah it ultimately is what gets him killed also y- at least he's able to you know go out saving people instead of you know just thinking of himself as a fighting and, a war and, for somebody man, else yeah that they, he never really should have been in to begin with right uh and Man, that that scene where you know he's bleeding out, and Darlene just you know tells help Jeff Bridges to help him, and Jeff Bridges you know pretends to be an actual priest just to be able to help him help him uh you know get his absolution that he's been seeking uh, out the last the rites ta- or whatever. Yeah, just yeah, says, what's what makes that scene even better though is she says it twice. First she says it, he looks at the wound and he's like, "There's nothing I can do about that." So then, in a much calmer, much more uh, solemn way, she says help him the performances in that scene are so fucking good oh like my the way God. she the way that she conveys that with you know just repeating the line jeff bridges is amazing in that sequence uh man the, uh, when he says you're not a priest he says of course i am like the way he says it just all casually like what are you talking about of course i am and as as he's just you know just breaking down as he's trying to you know, he, probably didn't do any homework is he's just kind of making it up as he goes along but he's just trying to do whatever he can to you know 
Yeah, and to give Miles peace. hangs on until he hears that he's absolved of all of his sins, and then that's when he goes. Yeah, it's tough. Oh, uh, it's so sad. It's it's so sad. And, and, like, and again, he's the real victim about- of the movie. Everyone else he- in this movie besides Darlene is a shitbag. And he's kind of the victim in the movie. <laughs> and you're about to cry over the death of the guy who's in the movie for basically five minutes. Yeah. You know, they, they, there's a lot of like character building in, in the very heroin addict time. in the maintenance closet. That's what you're supposed yeah. to think of him. That me- and he's the one you're crying over. It's so good. It, it, and that's one other thing that I think different, uh, differentiates it a lot from Tarantino stuff is there's a lot of empathy that you have for the characters. You typically don't have that for Tarantino characters. They're just they're, they're just usually kind archetypes. of all shit bags. <laughs> yeah, they're they're you know smartest dude in the room, super cool archetype. They're not a person. These are all you know people with with flaws, and it makes them more interesting. Yeah, and I I feel like people just got so caught up in the the, the title cards and the the intricate like connected. But what is it doing Time a title jumps. card nowadays? I mean, this was 2018 is kind of when we started doing that. It, well, no, this is incredible. I mean, Pulp I Fiction does it several times. It, it is right. a direct callback to Pulp Fiction, pretty much. It I mean, is. You know, they, yeah. just, right now, it's just the way you make a movie. Like, instead of establishing yeah, shots, true. we have to have the name of the city plastered across the screen, even though I can fucking see Big Ben in the background or whatever. I've got <laughs> yeah. London all over the screen. <laughs> yeah, like, that's true. You know. That's true. It's just, yeah, but uh, but it's just like people just got like so over fixated on the wrong shit it make and, it and just bad, and they just they just totally miss like all the good shit in, that is in the movie. Just focusing on never gave abs- it a chance is what happened. Yeah, never never gave it a chance. Just focusing on the wrong aspects of it and missed out on, yeah, you know, just really really good stuff here. Yeah, it's a great great movie. I also just got a, a you know the. Uh, Fucking bounty hunter dudes from Buster Scruggs. I just, I just got like a, <laughs> like a, just an idea, just like have them to show up at the hotel. <laughs> I'd watch that show. <laughs> uh, do we speculate wildly about the film or management? <laughs> well, it, I, I, it's got to be JFK, right? On the, on the film, that's it, the only one that makes any sense to me. Especially with, uh, you know. Two people fucking. We know he did that a lot, and the fact that she says, "I know him. He's dead," and, and the is... fact that 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 Rose knows him, yeah, because she is so detached from mankind. You know, it's got to it, be. It has to be a president. It's got to be someone big. Yeah, yeah. That line that Hemsworth has about it too is so good. Where he's talking about, you know, sometimes the memory of a man is more important than the man himself. Like, yes. holy shit, that's a good line. That's a really good. That I thought that should be on a wall somewhere. It's so good. It's so good. Yeah. I yeah. am really curious about about management though, because Edgar Hoover, dude, fucking had a file on anyone that was anyone at all times. Like he was a, such a shit bag, and he yeah. had a file on every politician, every celebrity, every movie star, every athlete, like everything, and. He just filed it away, and then if he needed to use someone, he pulled it out and showed them what he had. And that is just the way he was. He is clearly aware of this hotel because he, they, uh, FBI has bugged this hotel, and they have sent John Hamm to get their bugs back. So the FBI is against whoever is running this hotel. I just, I don't know. I, I think it's actually smart for them to not go into detail. No, I, I know it's smart. It makes, I'm just, I'm just curious, yeah. like. Yeah, just who, who is management? Yeah. Like, is this the yeah. is this the secret or, origins of the Continental? Like, what what is the El Royale, dude? I mean, and are they in my, California or Nevada? I mean, Nevada, Miles sorry. could be one of those goddamn assassins. Like, he he goes John Wick mode in this movie, right. so I could I could buy it. Is John Wick's uh like uncle? Interesting too, just the simple fact that Miles got selected for the job. Right. They specifically chose a dude who had 120 confirmed kills in Vietnam and is clearly just gone. Broken. So easy they, to control because he's yeah broken. easy 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 to control is just you know it's it's so cruel to make him do that job. You know? I get the feeling that when fucking Emily holds up his bag 
of heroin and says, do you want this? And then asks her question again. That is not the first time that has happened to him by based yeah. on his reaction. So tragic, man. What a good character. What a good movie. But I'm pretty sure when I saw Miles go into full Terminator mode is when you and me just sitting in the auditorium by ourselves, I just went, holy fuck, like out loud. Uh, yeah, yeah, because it just, <laughs> it just, in like the, the editing turns into John Wick mode for a second. Yeah. It's just like super quick cut, but not like obno obnoxious. And it's just intense and, and awesome. Because, I man, I'll, I'll watch uh, murder cult members get shot with Miles all day, dude. It's awesome. Oh, my God. It's so good. And they were just so outclassed by who they were up against. <laughs> yeah. Uh. They're, just, they're just fucking dipshits, man. Like, Can I say something that I appreciate also before we wrap this up? Of course. I want to say it was on uh, a late show with Stephen Colbert. And it was Jeff Bridges getting ready to talk about Bad Times at the El Royale. And when they start talking about the movie... Jeff Bridges just goes on this rant about how pissed off he is that in the trailer they show the line of him saying he's not really a priest. And he oh, was Oh yeah. And he was just this. so angry about that and he just went on a rant about like what is even the point? Like that is the whole point of the movie. He's like of course I'm not a priest. You don't need me saying it in the goddamn trailer like he's just going on and on and on and on. Yeah, um, about that. Yeah, it's just like thank you Jeff Bridges. Yeah, and, and it, that, it, that's up there with Star Wars Episode Eight trailer coming out, and then Mark Hamill tweets, "Don't watch it." <laughs> like, oh yeah, right. <laughs> and it, it's it, dude, it just sucks that we, we can't even enjoy movie trailers all the time anymore. They used to be so good. Yeah. At least I remember them being so good, and I go back and watch the one with the Rocketeer, and I was like, "What's the point in watching the movie now?" No, the, the absolute fucking worst one. I, I, I just. <laughs> If you have to go watch a trailer and just be mesmerized at how fucking awful it was about just cliff noting the entire goddamn movie, watch the trailer for Star Wars Episode 2. Oh, yeah? Every fucking scene. The entire, like, what does that movie have? Like, four good scenes, maybe? But, Jeff, All in the they're trailer. smarter than this. How could they let this happen? God damn it. <laughs> That's Episode 2, right? I'm right? I think so. I don't, yeah. I don't fucking know. <laughs> I've got... I've got PTSD when over that get, fucking When they movie. get trapped in the force field and Obi-Wan turns around, now hold on, we're smarter than this. How did we let this happen? <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, any any other uh, stuff you want to talk about with Bad Times? I'm glad we got to cover it finally. We've been wanting to cover it for a while. I have an excuse to watch it again. Uh, I just want to watch it again. I, I love the fact that I waited three years to watch it because I had forgotten about some of the like more surprise like I, I remember you know like the john ham thing but i i forgot about uh jeff bridges getting hit with the bottle so i was like oh shit yeah i forgot I about, about that, that too yeah um, i love the poster i think i want you to go check out the poster it's the it's the profile picture on imdb with uh with hemsworth front and center <laughs> hemsworth is front and center shirt open all the characters behind him like it's a marvel poster and then rose in silhouette just kind of dancing down the street in front of the hotel Love it. And the hotel sign illuminated behind her. I can't tell. Does she have a she have the knife in her hand? Cannot tell. But man. But like watch. for a character that's barely even in the movie before getting shot, like Rose is at the center of the poster, silhouetted. Yep. But yeah. Uh no. Awesome. Great movie. Awesome movie. More awesome people movie. need to watch it. And I'm just you and I talked about if we could just get one more person to watch this movie. I did that two nights ago, and it sounds like you did it tonight. So we each got at least one more person to watch the movie. Yeah. Just please give it a chance. It's so fucking just good. Just give it a chance. Just give it a chance. That should be the tagline for our podcast. Screenplay just rewind. Just no. give it a chance. I wouldn't subject anyone to this podcast. That's not fair. <laughs> oh, it's so true. That was on the film. It was just an audio recording of Screenplay Rewind. It's like, oh, God, it's terrible. Burn it. <laughs> That's what it was. That's it was, it was just Screenplay Rewind. It was just our yeah. logo on every frame. That... They're like, oh, God, throw it in the fire. Is that what I think it is? <laughs> 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 oh, man. Uh, let's, let's talk about what we're covering next time. Yes, please. I'm so excited. So what we decided to do, in a little bit of a, a little franchise special like we've been doing off and on, for the month of December, uh, if you want to feel incredibly old, 
which I already do. Yep. Uh, is I'm the 20th you. anniversary of the Fellowship of the Ring. Ugh. So, man, yeah, that's hard to hard to say. That's I, rough. I was flipping through my TV the other day on the home screen on my, like, what is it, like, the Google Play that's built into Sony TVs or whatever. It's like yeah. the 20th anniversary of the first Harry Potter movie. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Please do. 2001. No. Let's see. I graduated 2004, so that's ninth grade for me. I'm not even driving yet. I have my learner's permit. I was 10 years old. A wee Fuck. lad. With so much hope. <laughs> 15, yeah. No, I'd be 16 at that point. Because I was 85 to 2001. I'd be mm -hmm. 15 or 16. I'd be 16. It came out in December. So I'd be 16 already. So that'd be 10th grade for me. There you go. There you go. Yeah, we're, so we're going to cover all of Lord of the Rings. That We're not doing The Hobbit, but like Fellowship, Two Towers, and Return of the King for December. Uh, but when The probably, Hobbit probably, turns 20, we'll be there. I don't, I'm not really that big of a fan of the Hobbit movies. I, I, might, I might just let that kind of fade into obscurity, personally. <laughs> but I fucking love Lord of the Rings, so we will be covering those. I'm excited to talk about it. Oh, man. Like, it's gonna be any so good. excuse. Any excuse to rewatch those movies. And we're doing this in a back-to-back -back series, right? Yeah, we're going to be releasing... It might change a little bit. Uh, I don't want to confirm anything just because you never know with the holidays. But yeah. we're going we're gonna to be doing all three within the month of December. Uh, drop dates tentatively as of this time so so pay attention to twitter you're saying follow uh yeah follow the twitter at spr filmcast you can follow us for show updates and ron where can people find you when you are not talking about awesome neo-noir crime thrillers with me i am ron sense tv on twitter youtube and twitch there you go all right and yeah go watch lord of the rings bro please go do it please all we have those. a lot to talk about Yes, we do. We talk about man. Hell, I can talk about Ian McKellen two hours and just every every time you know how fucking awesome is Ian McKellen? This oh movie? my god! I mean, it's I could do a whole podcast about Ian McKellen, right? Ugh. Fucking legend. There's a really cool tweet he had sent out where um, he's been recently doing. I, I don't know what the show is, but I think he was doing kind of like he's, uh, he's not doing anything recently, is he? Oh, Ian McKellen. Okay, hold on, I'm thinking Ian. Uh, yeah, never mind. You're, no, you're good. Uh, wrong, he's, wrong been doing, he's been doing stage acting recently. Yes. Uh, off of the, uh, I think like the, I don't, I know I don't what remember what it's called. Uh, he's been doing a show on like, what is the London Broadway? You know what I'm talking about. I don't know the name of it, but he had a picture of like one of his uh, co-actors in like the current thing where he had done a project with that same actress in the 70s. So he had a, a sh like a shot by shot photo comparison of him and the actress in the 70s. In a similar pose now is so cool. You know, like 50, 60 years later, still still acting together. Very cool. Fucking love that man. He's the best. Dude, does is anyone better friends than Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen? I don't think so. Because my God. Their adventures when they're together that they, they both post to Twitter. It should be a TV show. They I would really the could. I would watch a whole TV show of just them being them, not even being characters, just them being them. Just out on the town. Yeah, they're the best. Love those guys. They're so good. Patrick Stewart's nuts anyway. His yeah. fucking Halloween lobster costume. I fucking <laughs> love it. I love him. It was his, uh, I think him in a ball pit, coming out of a ball pit was his Twitter profile last time I saw, but um, his banner for a while was him in the bathtub, laying, just laying down in the bathtub in the lobster costume that his wife had bought him. Because they had like a, uh, like a Halloween party they were going to go to or something. And he wasn't going to wear a costume because he wasn't even that interested in going. And she's like, it's a costume party. You have to wear a costume. And then he's like, I don't want to wear a costume. So she's like, if you don't wear a costume, I'm going to pick you a costume. And he's like, fine, pick it. I don't care. And she bought the cheapest fucking lobster costume <laughs> that she could buy. And it was like his favorite thing. <laughs> he, like, um, he took several photos in it. But to hear him tell it in an interview... He apparently just wore it to like the supermarket. Like he just wore that lobster costume everywhere. <laughs> yeah, absolute legend. Oh god, I love it. I love both of those men so much. John Reese Davies. Yeah. We can also do soon entire entire podcast about goddamn John Reese Davies. He's two characters in Lord of the Rings. That's true. Yeah, Treebeard. So we get a developer John Reese Davies talks. Yeah, I'm so excited. I watched. I just watched. 
uh, Lord of the Rings all over again a few months ago. You're Doesn't matter. <laughs> Doesn't no, I'm, I'm watching that shit again. But we're talking about any excuse. Uh, excuse. It's funny. Right. What do you what do you associate? Uh, uh, um, fucker McFuck. Uh, fucker McFuck. What? I can see his <laughs> face. I can't. I Which just guy? lost his name as I was trying to say it. Elrond. What do, oh, what, um, what franchise? Hugo Weaving. Do, huh? Hugo yes. Weaving. What the ma- franchise the Matrix. do you? The Matrix uh, is the first one I think of. That's the first thing you think of. Yeah. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. I fucking yeah. love the Matrix too. I haven't seen the Matrix since it was in theaters. I don't. Well, I have to rewatch those again soon too because they have the fucking new one coming out next month. Oh, yeah, I soon. heard about that. Hmm? I haven't yeah, been following actually, that one. One of the Wachowskis back, and uh, yeah, I'm all about it. I like the Matrix. Third one kind of meh, but I, I like how this is involved in more tangents. But uh, I until, hated the third Matrix movie Man when it of came Steel, out. Until Man of Steel, the third Matrix movie was the best Dragon Ball Z movie I'd ever seen. True, but I remember it pissing me off just because they spent like five minutes in the Matrix 3. You yeah. know, kind of weird. But uh, I, I came around it a little bit rewatching it last time. I was like, eh, hey, it's not as good as the other ones, but it's okay. So whatever. Less uh, <laughs> invested teenage angst Jeff getting mad at the Matrix 3 for no reason, I guess. For being the Matrix 3. So, oh, so, oh, so what was what was the franchise that you most associate Hugo Weaving with? Was it Lord of the Rings for Elrond? Is that where I, you're coming I from? I think it's probably Lord of the Rings. Because Elrond is, even though he doesn't do a lot, what he does do is important throughout those movies. And just that voice and how... Just the way he even stands in the room as Elrond, you can just tell he's the guy that's fucking in charge in the room, you know? But he, but it's... And, and he can convey that without, without being words. obnoxious about it. Yeah. He, he, and he's just so self-assured in, in a way that the dude that's been around for, you know, thousands of years would. But and yeah, then we'll, that scene we'll in Return of the King when he reveals the sword's been reforged, like... Oh my, spoilers, Ron, holy shit. What? They reforged yeah. the sword? That movie's oh, only 18 years old, bro. Come on now. <laughs> you can't can't talk about it. Oh, yet, God. Yeah. Return of the King can vote. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> 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 on that note, I'm going to go be the press about how old I am. <laughs> Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>